God is called a shepherd. The Lord is a shepherd and he speaks about his people, his sheep, as though they have no shepherd. But at some point in time, they're going to have a shepherd who will keep them from going astray. It's always been the issue with the people of God. Even those who want to be the people of God, they always go astray. That's been the problem with mankind. Even as we look throughout the history of the Old Testament, the, the different scriptures, uh, for example, Psalm 28, 9, he says, save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd also and carry them forever. So the issue is that the people need a shepherd who will keep them forever. So they will no longer go astray. That's the problem that they have. He describes them as people who have no shepherd and they go astray. And that is not, he describes his, he describes the children of Israel as people who have no shepherd and they walk about as though they have no shepherd, always going astray. And he wants to put an end to that. And so we want to talk about is him as the shepherd and then we as his sheep, because ultimately Micah 5, 4 is going to prevail where he says, and he will rise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. The, point is, the time is going to come where they're going to have, or we're going to have a shepherd and the sheep will remain according to the text. Now, what I want to do is I want to look up something as Jesus describes us as him being the shepherd and we being the sheep. And I also want to use something, show us how we look up certain words. You can apply this to what I'm saying here. This should be a source of great comfort. We've covered this before, but I want to go even more in depth just doing a word study. And then you can also apply this in other times of your studies. And so let's go to John 10. And we'll look at the two passages that I bring up the most in John 10, verses 4, 5, and then also 27 and 28. But in verse 4, we're going to see this phrase, him saying this, when he puts out, puts forth all his own, well, his own, what? well, he's talking about sheep. He says that verse three to him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. So just looking at the text, what does it say? It says the sheep, whoever the sheep are, he's not giving conditions for them being sheep. He just says that these sheep, whoever they are, they do hear his voice. Now, I just want to make sure that I have the English and the Greek up because I want no one to say that uh, I'm putting words into the, the, to the mouth of Jesus or um, imposing something on the text. I only want to take only what the text says. That's all I want to take away. And in this text, what can, what can we observe? That he says that his sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep, meaning that they are the sheep belong to him. And so he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. Who does he lead out? His sheep. That goes back to what he's always wanted was for the people to have a shepherd and that the sheep do not go astray. The sheep do not scatter. That's been the problem. So verse four, here we go. When he puts forth all his own, his own what? His own sheep. He, the shepherd, goes ahead of him and the sheep follow him. Now he's telling us that the sheep, whoever they may be, no conditions are set upon them, that the sheep follow him. Not if the sheep behave a certain way, if they do certain things, then they follow him. He simply says, this is Jesus, remember, who says the sheep follow him. And he tells us why the sheep follow. He's more than gracious. He's more than kind to give us even more detail, to give us the reason why this happens. He says, because, here's the word for because, hati, because they, that it's a sheep, they know his voice. So we can observe that the sheep do know the shepherd's voice and the reason why they follow him is because they know his voice now here verse 5 is where i want to kind of use our study skills and use the tools because it doesn't make any sense to know what a word is and then not know how to use the word not necessarily the english word but when we want to look up the greek word it does no good to look up the word and not know how the word is used now do you want to spend time constantly looking up the Greek or looking up the Hebrew, what a word means. No, you don't want to do that. The reason why is because the overwhelming majority of time, the English words are more than sufficient. But when you get stuck or there is some controversy, that's when it's helpful to look up the word. So if we're sitting here trying to figure out uh, or talking about Jesus dying on the cross, it's not a lot of controversy in that, that the Bible does teach that he died on the cross. Now, if someone wants to 
have a controversy as to what's meant by cross, that's fine. But if there's no controversy and it's and it's understood, there's no need to go and look it up. But in this case, we do want to look something up. We want to look at our tools or look at the word and understand how to use the tools. So in verse five, he says, a stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because and he tells us why, because they do not know the voice of the stranger. Now, this is where we jump in, and this is why I think it's vitally important to speak about the job of a shepherd and what it does, the impact of the shepherd on the sheep. Remember, he's talked about sheep before, sheep without a shepherd, how they go, how they go astray. And he's always spoken about how he would put his spirit in the heart of the people and they will walk according to his teachings. In other words, not go astray. And so Micah says that he will shepherd them and the sheep will remain. Well, how is that? Why is that? Well, Jesus is kind of reiterating that also in verse five. He makes a statement that you don't quite see in English. And this is where we're going to look at the Greek and then use our tools properly. A stranger, they simply will not follow. Well, how is this written in the Greek? Ume akalufe seisusen. Well, don't worry too much. Well, I'm sorry. We do want to worry about the akalufe susen. This word is a plural future active indicative. What does that mean? So if we were to look at that word, the word would tell us that it means to follow. Well, knowing that it's to follow helps, but we need more. Because if it's a future active indicative and it's plural, it means that they, who's a they, so not just one, but they, all of they, the sheep, plural, the sheep will, because it's a future active indicative, it's telling us what they will do. So the sheep will follow. However, we know he's not saying the sheep will follow, but the word aklothesis means they will follow. The word there are two words that are seen here: the word u and the word may. If you notice them, look below me, you see the definition. The word u means not or no, and the word may means not or less or no. So we have two words that negative a statement so he says they will not follow in the future well we've got two of these words what does that mean having two words because you would think the way we would say it in english we would just say no they will not follow they will not follow in the future but in greek uh, one of the strongest ways to um, emphatically negate the possibility of, or the possibly negate something from happening in the future is if you put a double negation in front of a future active indicative. This is probably the second most emphatic way, the strongest way to negate something. We'll look at the, the most, uh, the, the strongest way in just a second. And I'm doing this because I want people who, even those who might disagree, to go and check the work. There will be those that will say, well, no, Corey, your, your rationale, the way you say this has been debunked. Well, no, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm showing you uh, the formula that I'm using. So a person will have to come back and say, well, no, the reason why you're incorrect is because u or may or aklopesusin is incorrect. The way you use it is incorrect. And so I want to be deliberate in this because I want you, one, to have comfort in what Christ has done. And then two, whenever you are confronted by someone who disagrees, you can also uh, assure yourself, but also explain it to them. Peter says, always be ready to give a defense of the hope that you have. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is literally us giving a defense, a reason for the hope that we have. What's the hope that we have? Salvation and to have it eternally forever and that it never be taken away, that it never be forfeited, never be lost, whatever vernacular you want to use, that if you're saved today, you can be rest, you can rest assured that you'll be saved tomorrow and into the future. And so let's go back to this. And I want to look up a word. I want to look up this word may. It's also the way that you negative something. And so if we were to go look up may in what's called the BDAG, uh, we're going to get a good definition of what this means. Now, the way that it's used to know that it means a marker of negation, that helps, but it doesn't help enough. The reason why is because there's there are more nuances to it. So we know that may, as he says, denies the idea it denies the idea of something. Well, the idea that's being negative is the idea of ever following a stranger in the future. So let's just make sure that we understand that what's being negative is the idea of ever following a stranger. He says a stranger, they simply will not follow. Now he does come back and say, but they will flee. So he gives the converse that 
instead of them, the sheep following the stranger, doesn't mean that they may pay attention and look and listen for a second, but they won't, they won't keep following. They're going to turn away from that person. Because that's what Jesus says. He says they will flee from him because they do not know the voice of the stranger. So what's being negatized? The idea of them following a stranger. So go back to BDAG. And so let's go and look and see how this is used. So what I want to do is I want to stroll down and look at how it's used. It's used as a mark of negation in a negative clause, in a conditional clause, uh, in the purpose clause where there's henna in order that they not. We see examples of that. Uh, results clauses. Let's drop down a little further in different various moods that it's used. And understand when we're talking about verbs and things like that, we have to understand that there are uh, voices, tenses, and moods. Voices meaning middle voice, uh, present, and so forth. Uh, passive, that means it's happening to you or you're doing the action or it's you're doing it or it's being done for the benefit of you or by others. Things like that. The, the, the tense is past, present. Um, is it perfect tense, which we really don't have in English? Those sort of tenses. Uh, and so continuing. Oh, I'm sorry. And by the way, subjunctive or indicative. What what mood is it? Is this a possibility, potentiality, or is this a fact? Is this a kind of the right now thing that's happening? So we look at this going forward, going down as we look at how may is used. If we drop down here, we're going to see in a, in a prohibitive sense. In an independent clause uh, with the subjunctive, let us not. That's where we, that, the subjunctive is the is the mood. Let us not do this. May we not do this. But then, as we drop down further, we're going to see uh, the use of may differently. We see as a marker of conjunction, uh, as a marker of expectation of a negative answer. Uh, will they not, or they will not? Uh, you ask a question, and then the the no is implied. It's understood. But then we get to where it says re marker of reinforced negation. And so let's keep looking. We're going to see where he speaks about this emphatic negation. And just as a matter of fact, I think I went too far. Um, a marker of reinforced negation. Look what it says. U may in combination with U. So here we have it in combination. May in combination with the word U. Well, what do we have here over here in John 10? U may. U may. May you guys see that being highlighted? So we go back over to BDAG, the marker of reinforced negation. So in combination with U and May. So both of these together has the effect of treatment. What does it do? U May is the most decisive way of negativing something in the future, meaning that it will not happen. Absolutely will not happen in the future. Now we're going to come back to this in just a little bit, but let's go back to John 10. So he says that the sheep will never, never in the future, they will never follow a stranger into the future. It's just not going to happen. So you could not come back. I guess you could come back and say, well, no, of course, it's not what it means. Well, then tell us it's it's on the onus of the person that disagrees to say, well, no, this is why a, a, a sheep could or would follow. Jesus is not offering conditions. He's making a statement of fact. They will not in the future, now or into the future, follow a stranger. We know he's speaking about now because he just told us that sheep follow him. And he tells us even to the future that they will never go after a strange voice. But what will they do instead? They will flee. Why? Because they do not know him. Why do we follow him? Because we know his voice. Why won't we follow the stranger? Because we do not know the voice of the stranger. So how we use that particular tool is just good to go and not just look at the definition of the word, but also to look at how the usages of the words apply. Now we're, we're speaking about this word may, even though there are two words that are there to negate something. We'll come back to that. Matter of fact, let's go to John 10, staying in 10 and move all the way down to verse 27. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. Before we get there, let's go to verse 14. So that we understand the context again. So Jesus wants to reinforce. He says, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. He knows his own what? His own sheep and his sheep know him. And he just told what happens to the sheep who know him that his sheep follow him. And why? Because we know his voice and the ones who know his voice, he's already declared those are my sheep. I am the good shepherd. 
I know my own sheep and my own sheep know me. Even as the father knows me and I know the father, I laid down my life for the sheep. Which sheep? His sheep. I have other sheep, very important as well, which are not of this fold. I must bring them or I will bring them and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Well, who's he speaking of? Well, in this case, it's pretty clear, especially as we look at other scriptures, we won't have the time to do so right now, but he's speaking of Gentile. The Gentile sheep, what does he say about them? He says, I have other sheep who are not of this fold and I must bring them or it's necessary for me to bring them uh, and they will hear. So what? notice what he says, and they will hear the voice of mine, the voice of mine, they will hear. The akosus, and this is a plural future active indicative, just like we had a future active indicative in verse five that they will follow, or in this case, they will not follow. But in this case, it's not negative. So it says they will hear my voice and they, and they will become one flock. So he's telling us what the, the other sheep will do, the other flock will do, the Gentile sheep, what they will do. Now, this is where we get into um, more controversy. This should not be controversy. It should be a source of great comfort. It, it To me, it's kind of baffling how you can be offered something uh, that, is, that, that, that is the most important thing that you have being secured, your salvation. And I guess some people think that it's just too good to be true. Well, then you're going to miss out on the point of you knowing about this. So Jesus says that I told you, uh, you don't believe me. Why? Because you're not my sheep. Verse 26. But here we go to verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. There's no condition here. There is no condition to say that, uh, well, you have to keep hearing his voice. No, he's, he's telling us what his sheep do. Uh, well, as long as you remain, no, that's not, that's not here. Jesus is talking to these Jews about his true sheep. And he tells, he tells them about his sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Now we already know that, that they, that he knows us and we know him and we follow him and they follow me. He's already told us why we follow him because we know his voice and a strange voice we won't follow. So we're either following after him or following after a stranger. We're not following after the stranger. There will be those that will follow after that strange voice, but it won't be us because we don't know the strange voice. Now, someone can say, well, that necessarily implies that those that follow after the strange voice must know the strange voice. I'll leave that for someone else to argue. But the point that Jesus is making is that we don't know it. Now, can we hear it? Can we hear someone preaching Islam uh, or Buddhism or just atheism or some sort of new age uh, teaching or how to deconstruct from your faith? We can hear someone, but it, it doesn't resonate. That's his point. There's no understanding. It doesn't take root. And so therefore, we don't follow after that. Those that do, he says, those are, they could not be his sheep. Could you be a sheep and follow after another voice if Jesus just negated the possibility or negated that ever happening in the future? If Jesus says, my sheep, my sheep, his own sheep, the one that know him, if he says they will never follow after uh, a strange voice, and then someone who says they are a sheep, is following after a strange voice, then what does that mean? It can't mean that Jesus is lying, that Jesus is wrong. It means that you must have thought you were a sheep, but you're not. You're following after this voice because it's not a strange voice to you, apparently. So going back to verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. And here it is, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now. What I want to focus on is also in the Greek. We looked at this word before. As a matter of fact, I want to look at a couple of things in the Greek. We looked at this word before, um, apolo, apolontai. This word is, we talked about looking at the word and the, the voice, the tense, the moods, and so forth of a, of a word. The mood of this is what's called the subjunctive. The subjunctive is possibility something could possibly happen. If you could, and we played these games before, if you could possibly have this, if you could potentially do this, what would you do? Well, there is a way in Greek to say that it is impossible for this to happen. The possibility of something being negative, you would think just a simple negation, but then you could say it's not possible, which means it opens up the door a little bit for the possibility of it actually happening. And so what would you do? Well, just what we've been saying. The ooh, 
with the may offers a double negation of the possibility, meaning it is literally impossible. So if a person were to come back and say, uh, if this is impossible to happen, and then someone says, but what if this, but what if that, but what if A, but what if B, but what if C? Well, a double negation of the possibility means no matter what possibility you come up with, it's impossible. That's the point of the double negation. And so in this case, what's being negated? What's being negated is, and let's go back to this, is the possibility of perishing. So let's go back to BDAG. We're still looking at the May. And as we're down here, look at it. We're looking at the, the marker of reinforced negation in combination with the U may it has the effect of strengthening, strengthening the negation. And so we've already found out that U may is the most decisive way of negativing something in the future. If it's in front of a future active indicative, such as we had the U may akaluthesusen. But in this case, it's not in front of an, a future active indicative. It's in front of a subjunctive. And so let's go back to it. And so here we see the next part with part A with the subjunctive. And so we give we have some examples of if you see this in a phrase with a subjunctive, then the possibility is negative. Also in rhetorical questions, when the affirmative answer is expected to be u may, we can have that as well. But let's look and see if we see verses that speak about this. Well, over here we've got John 10, 28. That's also an example of the possibility is ne negative. Never, certainly not. It can never happen. That's the point. Now, there's other passages where you have this double negation with a the subjunctive there that don't relate to salvation, but most oftentimes when you see a double negation with a subjunctive, the possibility of something being negative, it's most often used as it relates to salvation, but not always. Sometimes it relates to something else. For example, in Matthew 5.18, if you look below me, he says that truly, I say to you, heaven and earth will pass away, um, but not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is completed. And this double negation, the possibility of the smallest jot or tiller or stroke passing away or not being fulfilled, that's negative. It's impossible for what Jesus says uh, to not occur. For I say to you that unless the righteousness of uh, the, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 20 says it's impossible for you to enter the kingdom of heaven. If your righteousness is like that of the scribes and the Pharisees, if it's not better, he says it's impossible. The possibility of you coming to heaven, if you're just like the scribes and Pharisees, it's there. And so it's used in other ways, and it literally means it's impossible. So going back to this, what he's saying is, this double negation of the future active indicative, the possibility is negated. Now I wanna, and I'm going slow and I'm being intentional by saying the possibility is negated, meaning that is impossible. So if he says you will never ever perish, to come back and say, yeah, but what if you stop believing? The possibility of you stop believing is not there. It's impossible. If believing, if hearing, if following is what sheep do and sheep will always keep following him because they know his voice, they understand his voice. If sheep will never, ever go after a strange voice, then you can't come back and say, well, but what if you do go after a strange voice? He's already said that. He's already said you're going to keep following. Well, what if you don't remain? What if you decide to become a Muslim? It's not not that you can not that a person can ever become a Muslim or become a Muslim means that you can still be safe. No. No, the point is, you're not going to become a Muslim. That's why he says, Ume Apolontai. It is impossible for his sheep to perish. He's already told us that. And so it's not going to happen. He says, I give them life into the ages, or eternal life. So this life into the ages tells us how long it is, and they will not perish. So now it's it's key to notice what is following behind this Ume Apolontai. Don't miss this. Is ton Iona. That is into the ages. So you will never so you cannot say that this is referring to when the person gets to heaven. No. He's saying even now going into heaven, into eternity, into the ages. Ume, you will never, ever, ever perish. The possibility of you perishing is negated 
even into or into the ages, into eternal life, into eternity. It's never going to happen. What's interesting, though, is that when you look on the English side and they will never perish, the uh, into the ages part doesn't show up in the English. Why they don't do that, I think they probably should. Some versions might, uh, but this particular version, the NASB, does not. But in the Greek, and this is where the Greek comes in, and it's helpful to see how is this used, Aiston Iona. That part is extremely important, and by the way, extremely powerful, and it solidifies and shuts the door for anyone saying, yeah, once you get there, you can never perish. That is not what this path, it cannot be because he used the phrase Aiston Ionian. You're, you're not there yet. So this is that you will not perish going into the ages. So it's never going to happen. And so this is why I think it's vitally important to see the role of the good shepherd on the sheep. He says for the sheep, they will never, ever, ever perish. It's impossible to perish. There are going to be those that are going to say, well, no, Corey, I think this argument has been debunked. And my question has always been by who? Who says so? Now, first you say, well, I disagree. Sure, you can disagree, and you can point to another passage. I disagree because of this passage. Well, what about this passage? What did I get wrong in this statement? Because if I got something wrong, then I think I should know. You should have pointed out. If what I'm stating is correct, and then there's another passage that says the opposite or different, that by definition is a contradiction. And so we have a contradiction in our scriptures, and we can't have that. Uh, if, if we've got one contradiction, we have a reason to put the entire Bible down, but we don't have a contradiction. And so I would say, respectfully, deal with the text. We do not have, I have not found one. And I know people say, well, this scholar disagrees. Well, the scholar can disagree, but he can't disagree with, by using the Greek. He cannot say, well, Corey, you're incorrect because Kygo didemi autois zoen aonion does not mean this. And ume avalontai aiston anion does not mean that. Okay, if it doesn't mean that, well, then what does it mean? He's, Corey, he's not negativing the possibility of you perishing. Well, then what is he negativing? That's the question. Or if we if we were to scroll back up to verse 4, same thing. If he's not negativing the possibility of, of us ever um, perishing, I'm sorry, or um, following someone even to the future, following the strange voice, well, then what is he doing? What does ume akaluthesusen mean? If it doesn't mean what I say, well, Corey Akaluthason is not a future active indicative, or it is, but the ume does not mean that you can never, ever, ever uh, 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 follow or not follow. What well, what does it mean then? If it doesn't mean that, fine, I'm open for that. But you have to use it. You can't come back and say, that's not what it means. Or if you keep doing this, or if that, because again, if we look through here, there are no conditions that Jesus is saying that his sheep have to meet other than they being his sheep. The only condition is if you are his sheep. And he tells us that we are his sheep and that all of his sheep will come to him, will follow him. Oh, by the way, in John 6, we also see this double negation, this emphatic negation used about him not losing one sheep and that all the sheep that he has was given him. And by the way, they will never, ever, ever, ever perish. As a matter of fact, let's go to one of the passages. Let's go to John chapter 6. I had intended on going to there, but let's go to John 6. John 6, and let's start at, I think, I think 37. Uh, all that the Father gives to me, uh, he says, will come to me, and the one who comes to me will certainly not be cast out. Here we have an ume ekbalo. So the same thing that we have here, uh, ume, the possibility of them being cast out by the Lord will never happen, but you can leave yourself. Again, we've already discovered what Jesus has told us his sheep will do. And he says, for I've come down for this reason, not to do my will, but him that sent me. He said, this is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, uh, I will lose none. Now, we talked about earlier about when we looked at the May, that if we have this um, to kind of go as part of a purpose clause, we have that here, we have this henna, in order that all the, one that, the ones he has given to me not apaleso. I will not lose any of them, but raise them in the last day. So what has he said? I will not lose one of them. And we have this double negation in verse 37 that helps solidify this. He says, and the, and for this is the will of my father, that everyone or all the ones that are believing in order that all the ones that are, that are, that are seeing or beholding the son and believing 
and Jesus refers to us as who are his sheep as believing uh, in him that we have life present tense we have eternal life and I myself will raise him I myself in the last day so it's kind of hard to come back and say well there are some exceptions where are the exceptions when Jesus doesn't give them he says truly truly I say to you that whoever believes in me has life whoever believes in me he has life echo um, he has present tense eke right now life right now and will never ever die as a matter of fact it's the same thing in john 5 24 we have passed uh death and will never ever ever go into judgment and so that's the result of the shepherd with the sheep and so again this is something that i think is very comforting i think we should look at this don't look at it as though the lord is trying to sell you a bill of goods trying to get you overconfident that is too good to be true no this is the lord jesus the previous effects before him was that sheep went astray doesn't make sense that he would do what he did die on the cross sent shed his blood to be the perfect atonement and sacrifice for us give us the holy spirit and sheep still do exactly what they did before go astray that 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 would be the ultimate waste of time waste of blood waste of death waste of a good scene um <laughs> when he's on the cross that didn't happen. What he did was what he said he was going to do. Be the shepherd as Micah, let's go back to it, as Micah 5, 4 says, that uh, he will arise and shepherd his flock, the one that, you know, the father gave to him, in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. They will remain. Who will remain? The sheep. And so thank God for him being the shepherd and thank God for the father giving us to the shepherd as sheep. Amen.